from all corners of the globe to your ears, it's the Midnight Movie Cowboys. Sometimes informative, sometimes controversial, but always unpredictable, it's the Midnight Movie Cowboys Podcast. With your hosts, Hunter, John, and Stu. And now, on with the show. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Midnight Movie Cowboys for this week. You've got myself, Stuart, um, and over in the Rocky Mountain High, I believe it is, uh, of Colorado, is to my right, is John Grace. Hey, John. Hello. Hey. Right. Hello, everybody. And um, no, Hunter, as you can see, but holy shit, look who we snagged. The big fish, the uh, enigma, the man of many... Um, Many accounts, but uh, never a face. And finally, down below. Many suspensions. Anthony, <laughs> yeah, Anthony Nesbitt, the Nez, our Ruber Tanya. breaking suspensions. Hello, hello, hello. All right. Okay. Um, so this week, uh, we're doing something unique. Three different countries. Yes. Yeah. Continents, even? I don't know. My, my First job. time, I think. Yeah, yeah. It's... Just gone 11 a.m. for me. Just gone 7 a.m. for you, John. 7 p.m. 7 p.m. 7 p.m. It's evening. And but for Anthony, it's balls ass late. It's two ten yes. t- 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 in the morning. Let's two ten in the morning. There you go. Ridiculously wow. late. All right. Um. So yeah, we're going to keep this one short, sharp, and sweet because it is, you know, um, dick ass late for Anthony. So. We're going to make it um, pretty quick. But anyway, uh, getting into this segment of Whip Out Your Junk before we get into the movie we're doing this week, which is uh, Minder on the Orient Express. Uh, excuse my look. I look and feel like absolute stir-fried shit. So, um, yeah, whatever. Nothing new. All right. So, John, you want to go first? Sure. I'll, uh, I'll make it quick. Um, first, I got this... Uh... Uh, Lawrence Ellsworth translation of the Three Musketeers. Oh, wow. um, apparently, he restores a lot of sex and violence that's been missing from uh, all the prior English translations, however mm-hmm. many there were. Because back when it was translated and sold to the West, it was uh, they toned things down because the French were allowing a lot more raunchy stuff in their in their books. It's supposed to be pretty interesting. It's said to be more readable than the classic editions we're used to so i wanted to check it out it was a recommendation from one of our listeners trent reynolds and he oh, really was on this yeah okay. he thought it was pretty good so i decided to check it out also i got um anthony might laugh when he sees these uh mandingo cds from this uh, <laughs> it was <laughs> it was a group that um it was kind of formed to do uh library music in a way for um british shows probably like minder uh it, it was a, it's a british group basically doing kind of phony uh, movie African music, tribal music, and um, re- really, uh, really cool stuff. Uh, some of these tracks were stolen for kung fu films and such, so it kind of led me. Never to, heard of him. Yeah, finding out what was out there and grabbing it. I'm big. I'm a big sucker for KPM uh, and DeWolf Library CDs. So oh, they're great. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. A lot of them so on Spotify. the type of stuff you'll hear on like a British show. Like if they're in a jungle scene, you'll hear this music. They've used them even for adult films kpm stuff yeah, yeah they do they oh yeah do they use that shit back in the 70s for the library because mm-hmm. well they just a small license fee you, you used yeah yeah it doesn't cost much apparently well, well used in the film she's to be really heavy on the wolf's library music and for, especially, in, especially in terms of mind that i mean they just like it was just so cheap it's just like why not bloody use it no one's going to notice and boy they did so that in terms of mind on the express they actually used that in the original soundtrack and it's just so noticeable it's just like oh the library music was just like nothing. It's, it's, it's an actual soundtrack. And, like, and no what? Dennis Waterman song either. They had to pay uh, yeah. Dennis wrote, Waterman wrote, for the rights for that. Wrote the theme tune, sung the theme tune. Yeah. 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 And we'll get into that shortly. All right, John, you got anything else? That's it. That's it. Anthony, what you got? Oh, shit. Sure, I sure got a pile of stuff. First of all, um, the AT Films Blu ray release of Sergius Lima's Violent City, starring him. Um, Let's have a look. There you go, uh, Charles hey. Bronson, Fe- featuring stunning, stunning audio commentary from Paul Talbot as usual, which is just basically worth the price of the disc alone. Yeah. Um, God, I love his audio commentaries. Secondly, the Euro, sorry, the 
Eureka video release, so Blu-ray release of Enemy Mine. I like the film, but it's not one of Wolfgang Peterson's best, but, you know, it's, it's good. It's yep. just basically a science fiction rip-off of John Borman's Hell in the Pacific. Um, thirdly, the Ricardo Free, the 1972 Giallo, the Iguana with the Tongue of Fire. I'm not a fan of it for the simple reason, not like any Giallo. It just basically cheats like crazy. Um, also, the Blu-ray release of the Darkman trilogy, haven't seen any of them. Um, you haven't? No, no, not one. Hmm. It's, just, it's only taken like 33 years to get around to watching them. Um, the Blu-ray release of Oliver Stone's Born on the 4th of July. I haven't, I haven't, in terms of Oliver Stone's winning streak from 80, 86 to 95, haven't seen it. I expect to be shouted up with a megaphone, but you kind of know that going in. Um, it's good. It's just like, you know, you're going to get your buttons pressed, but it's like, I'm, I'm carrying you, you, you can now. Um, the DVD release of so the Power of TV from a street hawk. It's like, you know, it's like, how, I've waited 37 years to actually watch it. It's just like, you know, again, no surprise. Um, T Books, the Bloomsbury copy of Peter Master's Serpico. Again, haven't read it. What, what oh, I've got years? that book. I've got the, yeah, I've got the, um, yeah, it's great. It's a good read. It's actually a lot more in depth than what the film is, which is usually the case. Yeah. Well, but, well, well, I I read this I read this two previous books last year, King of the Gypsies and oh, the, the Latchy Papers, both of which are very good. So yeah, I'd, I'd be surprised if it's anything less. Last, uh, not least, um, the second volume of Austin Tunick's History of Canon Films, nineteen eighty five to nineteen eighty seven. Um, oh wow! It's just like an absolute, absolute brick. Um, published by my one of my favorite publishing companies, Bear Manor. Um, and that, that's basically, it's like, it's like 957 pages. Jesus. Um, the, the, the third volume comes up, the, the third and final volume comes up next next year at some point. So, yeah, that, that's basically, yeah. All right. Very cool. All right, well, I'll go next. And I've got quite a bit of stuff as well. So uh, I've got first up, uh, as it is every week, I've got CDs of some sort, uh, Metallica's 598 EP, Grudge Days Re-Revisited. Used to have it on vinyl many years ago, but uh, this was going for a very, very nice price on Amazon. Um, so I picked it up again, following on the uh, weekly joke of what Weezer album did Stuart get this week? The latest one, Van Weezer. Uh, the second one they released in 2021. The first one was OK Human, which I brought up or showed a couple of weeks back, which was, OK, this is a belter. This is in the top four of their best Weezer albums. It's their uh, metal album where they pay homage to Metallica and Megadeth and, uh, of course, Van Halen. Uh, very, very impressed with that. 10 songs, 30 minutes, and they just rip as, right As, as approved by Eddie Trunk. Yeah. Wow. No, he's not a Weezer fan. <laughs> he's got no idea. Uh, the rest of the stuff comes courtesy of Nez. All oh, this stuff oh, I've got in the mail. Oh, no. Maybe, yeah. yeah. The uh, usual um, kicked about package by Australia Post. Those assholes, just, they come in just absolutely incredibly bad shape. I think, what are you doing? So anyway, real quick, let's belt through them. Uh, Nez was very nice sending me Nine Queens. That, DVD. Um, Marty on DVD. Uh, oh, this one is empty. Double whammy. Yeah, it's 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 good. Tom de, uh, Tom de Silla. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Tom, Tom uh, de Silla's Tom is also the type of guy who Jim Jumish would have been like if Jim Jumish had been any good. Um, oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. All righty. Uh, no. Carrying on. Christy Mulry's own double entry, which sounds rather naughty. Uh, no, it's not, it's, it's not the way to clap, but it's no. good. Oh. <laughs> um, this, I have no idea what this is, but uh, I flipped through it and it's something else. You know this, John? Uh, Oh, that's such, oh. A of, that's such a part of my childhood. In the okay. 70s and early, you couldn't go into a library in Liverpool without seeing a hardback copy of the Trigon Empire. It's just absolutely lovely. I'm cooking really? up the wrong age. All right. Well, so I'm going to look have... it up. What the hell is it? <laughs> just... uh, there's about, about five volumes. That's just the first. Yeah, just. Uh... Okay. Oh, shit. I didn't realize you'd slip that in there, mate. <laughs> <laughs> Another one I got to do up. Okay, no, cool. Oh, fuck, no, fuck it. What the hell? Yeah. They're, um, they're all shoved in between the pages, these covers that I'm doing for Nez. Yeah, it's that. It's kind of like, it's like a Watchmen style thing. Uh, well, the Trident Empire was published like, like 
1973. So it kind of, oh, it's that all by an inspiration for like Alan Moore and, and, and a couple of others. So, and, and okay. for anyone who's into 2000 AD, the 70s and early 80s, I mean, it's, it, it'll be very familiar. All right. Um, wow. Well, I'm going to show you. I've never heard of this, and it's cheap to get on Amazon here. So it's it's on Kindle. It's on that. It's a little Kindle Kindle platform on, on Amazon. So yeah, you probably get it okay. cheaper for the Kindle love the actual physical copy. Um, physical yeah. copy is only about two or three bucks more. Um, it's three hundred pages, so that's a pretty good deal. For it's that huge. Project. Yeah. It has a blurb from Neil Gaiman, but I won't hold that against it. Um, <laughs> Cat lady. All right. Anyway, I am gonna. Anyway. Uh, Next up is this graphic thrills number one. <laughs> keep it away from the kids. Just, 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 just keep yeah. it away from the kids. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, graphic thrills volume two. No, I'm not going to open up the pages. Um, but it is a it is a great book. These if, are, Karen these are... like, if Karen finds out you've got that, ooh. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> we say, oh, finally some inspiration. Um, I showed my brother these actually when he was over. He goes, "This is incredible." I said, "I said, I tell Anthony, Anthony, you do realize these things are worth a few bucks, don't you?" <clears throat> no, I mean, I mean, basically, if I've got so much stuff in the house that if I if I if I basically pass the week tomorrow, literally everything in the house would just go to the landfill. So it's just like, okay, oh, really? I've read, I've read that. What, what to do? And and that's it. It's just like so much stuff. It's just, like, and in, in, in terms of in terms of books and, and content, it's just like a battle going back years. So yeah, honestly, it's just like a, like a source of frustration in itself. Bloody hell. Yeah, I know. But um, lollipop sauce with John Holmes never, and never, never seen it. Never no, seen no, it. No, I've never even. I swear, I swear to God, I've never seen it. No, no. <laughs> they, uh, yeah, yeah. Hey, somewhere in the background, Hunter's sweating like a pig. <laughs> <laughs> he's probably thinking, "Fuck, thank God I'm not on this week's episode." Oh, no, no, <laughs> nah, he's good. And finally, keeping in the adult tradition, holy shit, this turned up. A friend of mine found out about this when I was with my brother and some friends for dinner on Wednesday, just gone, and uh, he flipped the hell out. From 1975, is it? Here comes Harry Reams. Long, long, long lost book. Before Harry Reams' trial. <clears throat> oh, yeah. Yeah, good couple of years for his just, trial. Just, Two or three years. Just, just as well. Um, have not read this yet because I'm still reading the Lunar Chicks book, and I don't like to read more than one book at a time. It was republished like, like four years ago, but up until that point, I mean, if you could, if you could look, if you went to Amazon to look for a copy, I mean, it would be good, good for silly money, just silly places. Yeah. I looked at the guy. Weird. Yeah, but the friend of mine goes, where did you get it? I said, my, my friend Anthony in the, the UK sent it. He goes, fuck hell. He goes, he was looking for it everywhere. I said, well. I mean, one of the things you'll notice, too, is that the pages are great. I mean. I know. A- yeah, I, said, I was telling my brother, I said, look, pages are, I don't know if it shows well here, but pages are gray with the black text on them. Oh, they used one of the, they wanted, they used one of the original copies and it was just like so deteriorated that they just thought, the only thing we can do with it is just we can print, just print the pages in grey, and it's just like I think it's, I think it still works, but yeah, then again. Oh yeah, it's a, yeah, legible, bit perfectly legible, but um, yeah, just I looked at it the first time, I go, wow, pages grey with a white border around each one, but um, no, it's uh, I was stunned by it. Anthony, honestly, thank you for ever all this, mate. I really uh, do but, appreciate it all. Just, again, just like keep it away from the kids because the kids are just like dad, dad, who's Harry Reams, and <laughs> it's like. No, don't want to know. No, 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 no. Okay. They, they know dad's stuff. Don't, don't touch. Know. You, don't, you don't want to know. So. No, dad's dad stuff and his hot sauces don't touch. <laughs> anyway, all right. So that's all the junk out the way. Now we're going to get into 1985 Minder on the Orient Express. Now, I knew Minder as a kid through the old man watching it. He was a religious viewer of it. Nez obviously knows it uh, growing up with it. John. Mm-hmm. Had you seen any Minder before? No, you had pointed out a box set was available, I think, in Australia, and I'd never heard of it. I'd seen the Sweeney, but um, I only really knew Dennis Waterman from the uh, Little Britain spoof of him, which I didn't even understand when I saw Little Britain. Like, I didn't get it at all. No. They had a running gag where one of them was playing Dennis Waterman, and he's only like a foot tall or something, and he's even, even though he wasn't trying to get. No, he wasn't. <laughs> no. 
and and I didn't get the joke, but then um, and I still really don't. But uh, I watched the Sweeney. So when you had mentioned Minder, my local library had the first season box set at the time. So I went and checked it out, watched all the episodes, and enjoyed it. And mm. um, I've got the second season that I need to start on. And watching this movie reminded me I needed to get back into watching it. And I found out my library has the other season box set, so I don't even have to buy it, which is great, and um, can just check it out and enjoy it at will but um it was uh i i thought it was pretty unique because um it's it's not like an american show which tends to like i always say that american shows seem to be written where the characters are idiots and things happen because they're dumb yeah and here things bad things happen to them kind of because they're trying to be very smart and conniving which is a, mm. a different twist to the crime comedy type of thing and um we don't really have anything close to this in america except for maybe Rockford Files and Switch, this old forgotten show with Robert Wagner and Eddie Albert, which is very similar, but was on a few years before Minder. Um, okay. But uh, but but yeah, I mean, I enjoyed it. I was like, this is a lot of fun and, and unique. You know, it'd be hard to explain to Americans what's so appealing about it's it. It's very British. Just something they got to watch. Very yeah, British. Just, just yeah. the music. I mean, the the, the, guy, the guy in Little Britain was that Dennis Waltzman wrote the theme since Minder. A couple of years later, he wrote the he, he did. The t- comedy drama series um, for Yorkshire Television, Stay Lucky. Guess what happens next? Dennis Waterman basically writes the theme tune in the same way. Hence the little Britain gag. He wouldn't do a TV drama series unless he gets the chance to write the theme tune, sing the theme <laughs> tune, and be on, and, and, and be in the video. And that, yeah. That's the gag anyway. It's just like, so it's yeah. a contractual. Anthony, what would you say he's more known for? I'm, I'm probably guessing the answer of what I'm going to say. Minder or Sweeney? In the UK, oh, 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 both. Oh, both. I mean, I mean, I mean leave, leave aside the fact that he did a couple of Hammer, Hammer films, specifically a couple of later Dracula films. Scars like, of Dracula, I mean, yeah. I mean, there was, I mean, when, when the Sweeney came to an end, there was a two year lag between the, the fi- final episode of the Sweeney, season four, and the first episode of the season one of Minder. Um, so, so basically, it was just like it was just one, one, one show to the other. Mm. Um, I, I, I remember during, during the making of Minder, they would often wonder, they would often consider the idea of asking John Ford to do a guest, a guest spot. And every time it came up, they just thought, no, because it's just going to draw attention to itself in terms of that show. That Parallel before. universes, yeah. I think, well, yeah it, it, it would come up just like, can we get John to like, No, no, it's just going to draw attention to itself. And they never did. They never did. Good, yeah, good idea. And, and, in terms of the, in terms of the, the career, I mean, Eastern films would just use the same people all over, over and over again. So you had the Sweeney, four years of the Sweeney, they would come to an end. You had one season of Danger UXB, one season of Out, and then you had Minder. And it was just like the same crew members, just over, they would just use the same people all over. It's just, they had an in-house style, it was run and gun, all quick. And everybody just knew exactly what they had to do, and they did it, and they did it really well. It was really quick then. I mean, the, the, I mean, an episode of mine would cost them, it was taking like five, four or five days to film, and that would be it. Just, just straight Jeez, the next that's episode. fast. Yeah, that it's, fast. they don't even build sets for it, it looks like. They look like they just film it in stores and shops and garages and warehouses and everything. They just do, everything's on location. And it's Lawn pretty directs. unique. Yeah. Dennis, Dennis Waterman would make the point that in terms of shooting on Minder and Sweeney, that they didn't even have, even have to, like a trailer or what, I mean, if the artist needed to change a costume, they'd just do it in the back of somebody's car. It's just like, yeah. trailers? No. It's just, like, it's just like, that's it. It's just like back of the car. And, and they would. And as far as Eastern films were concerned, as long as there was a booze nearby, it didn't matter. Because frankly, it was, it was a TV production company where drinking was encouraged. Lots, just lots of it. Lots oh, of it. Dr- drinking think, encouraged you know, in the UK. Who would have thought? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The country that gave us uh, Peter O'Toole, uh, Richard Harris, <laughs> Oliver Reed. No, yeah, Oliver Reed. Eastern, Eastern yeah. films, well, Eastern films are based in a, in, a, in an old school in, in, in West, Northwest London, uh, Collar House. And guess what? Right next door to Collar House, there was a pub. And it's no exaggeration to say that the cast and crew members would basically spend more time in the pub than the production office next door. Yeah. Um, bloody hell. No Who wants to sit in the production office when you go down the boozer? <laughs> you know, knock back a pint oh, yeah. or, or five, play oh, darts. You can you can see the photographs on, online of John Ford and Dennis Sportsman it, just just in the pub, um, often looking just completely pissed. It's just there like, was. It's just like, 
when I watched this, I don't know if I watched this, I think it was when we watched the Sweeney movie that we did that you requested. There was a scene where there was John Thor completely smashed on the couch. I'm guessing that was pretty close to real. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I, I, to, to be honest, I mean, truth be told, I, I, I've never liked the film version of Sweeney. The reason being that it was just like, it was made, it was made for theatrical sales overseas. So in other words, it's just like, it was made for specifically for anyone who hasn't seen the show. And then it's just like, it's just like, it went so far away from the show. It was just like, no, with Sweeney 2, it's just like, brilliant. It's just like, okay, that didn't work. Take it back to basics, bring in Troy Kennedy Martin, bring back Tom Clay to direct it. And it's just like, yeah, that's it. And 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 it, and it didn't it didn't do very well in the UK. The first film did, yeah. but for whatever reason, when, when Sweeney Two came out, it just didn't do very well for, for whatever reason whatsoever. And it's just like they're just baffled. There's a very good book out called Shut It by Pat Gilbert, which is a basic history of the Sweeney, and it's worth checking out. Um, but yeah, I mean, Eastern Films was just like shocked. Uh, I don't know how well it did anywhere else. I mean, yeah, who can say? Probably popular over here with Sweeney was always. Oh, popular. oh God, yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, that, you know, that period in Australia, the seventies and eighties, you know, we were just obviously being part of the Commonwealth. Um, we were just inundated with British shows, and I obviously in my house, with yeah, I mean, dad being you know being a pom, it was always about British shows. You know, shit like. Uh, you know, I mean, it was, it was, it was a two-way street because we get we get an awful lot of Australian imports. An awful. No, you poor lot. bastards. I'm sorry. Oh, honestly. <laughs> I mean, honestly, the, the Sullivans is such a part of my childhood. It's just oh, like, oh, fuck. And now, and now, and now, it's, it, it, it was, it's just like, it's just like, yeah. yeah. Then this hey, hey Nez, I'll hit you with a show that you may know from the 70s. Oh. It did get a DVD release via Crawford's. Oh, uh, God, yeah. You ever heard of a show called Solo One with Paul Cronin? I used to watch it. I used to watch it. Oh, you, oh well, it's available. Oh, Paul Cronin? Yeah. yeah. It's the motorcycle cop. And, and the fiend, the fiend, the fiend, the fiend team is fantastic. It's just a yeah. second head for weeks. Um, oh, by the way, just, just a man, just a man. Um, Crawford made their own version of the Sweeney Special Squad. Um, yeah. So, so, so in Melbourne. I don't know if that's mm. on TV as well. But again, it's yeah. just like, oh, oh okay, we, we need to compete. It's just like, let's, let's knock it out. No. Nah. They, they yeah. did. Well, they had, cop, they had Cop Shop, which is different to, um, much different to Sweeney. But, you know, it's still police drama. And Cop yeah, Shop homicide. was... They made, they made Homicide. Made Homicide, yeah. Yeah, I forgot about it. I, I never really watched Homicide much as a kid, but Cop Shop I watched I mean, as a I kid. Mean, Hom homicide just ran for years. I mean, Oh, hell. it was like 13, 14 years. It was just ridiculous. I mean, um, if you wanted to be director in Australia, you didn't go to university. You went to Crawford's. And you said... Pretty, pretty much. And whatever, oh. whatever show you were basically thrown... Whatever show you had to basically direct next week, that's what you bloody well directed, and you cut your teeth on it. Yeah. I'm glad Crawford has actually got your uh, got the um their stuff that they're releasing on DVD. They're not cheap, but they are no, available no. regardless. Um, things like um all together now, the comedy from 1991, I think it was. Glenview High. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Glenview High. Where only the toughest Aussies survive. <clears throat> yeah. And um oh the other one, the the Henderson kids. But anyway, I'm just getting I'm rattling on. But um what I wanted to ask you was, Anthony, before we get into this film, there was a whole that whole glut in the seventies of the TV show would then produce an offshoot movie, Love Thy Neighbor, yeah, yeah. Bless This yeah, House. Yeah. Um, oh, bloody, bloody, even even that got a bloody film film spin off. Yeah, um, on the bus has got three. Yeah, three That's movies. That was another one. That was a. Um, never mind. How did they one. how did they do over there in the UK? Some did better than others. Some some did, some did well. Other. Others just like just stiffed. I mean, I mean, never, never mind the quality field. The whiff just died, just died. And for whatever reason, it was awful. But it just, it just scored big. I mean, it just ran for years. But then they got to the film version. It was just like no, no. It's on, it's on YouTube. Did you figure, care to go near? But I, I couldn't recommend it. I no, no. But um, I mean, some as you said, some were better than others. Love thy neighbor. I like the film. I've got the the Blu-ray version. I bought of it. But it's just mainly a rehash of scenes from the show yeah. with a with a skeleton thread of a story attached to it with the yeah yeah the father especially, Bill's father especially coming especially from about, Jamaica. The thing about Mind on Earth, especially it does it feels like a fully formed theatrical feature. Mm. I mean, whether that was actually intended for theatrical sales overseas, I, I just don't know. But it doesn't feel like two or three episodes just welded together for one for one ninety minute whole. It just no. it literally feels like a, a fully formed feature in its theatrical feature in its own right. Yeah. Um, but again, 
each of the films could have fought, might have fought themselves, you know, we'll, we'll show, but it's like we, we'll, we, we, we might sell it as a in theatrical format to the overseas territories. But, but again, it's just something I don't know. It was this that. film, was this actually theatrical release or was it a Christmas sort of thing? Oh, oh, it, it went out here Christmas Day, 1985. It was actually his big highlight. Um, it went up against the Christmas Day episode of Only Fools and Horses on BBC One. Both went out at the same time. Um, Mind Only Orient Express picked up 19 million viewers on Christmas Day evening, and it Ooh. wouldn't happen today. Um, the second, the second most popular, Christ- the second most popular program that day was the Christmas Day episode of EastEnders, followed by Only Fools and Horses, which, funnily enough, had a similar plot. And the, the characters basically went off to Amsterdam, but once they got there, they didn't bloody well do anything. Whereas in the case of Minder, they got them out of London and they got involved in an actual plot. Yeah, yeah. Those are Christmas specials. I mean, back, to be... back, back in the day, I, ITV and BBC would literally save the biggest, the biggest star television shells of the year for Christmas Day and specifically for 8 pm to 10 pm. Um, and it was just, it was, it was, it was cuff roads. I mean, it was just like a real ratings, ratings war on Christmas Day. And it was just bragging rights, to be honest. I mean, it, that, it doesn't happen today because it's the audience is just gone. Do you know and, what? Yeah, yeah. Eight, eight till ten PM, the the audience is already tanked up on on food and booze from I mean, throughout the oh, day. I mean, they fall asleep you know, in the chair and they class as a rating for a film. I mean, I mean, I mean, you had you had the Queen's Christmas Day speech at three PM. Yeah, it just gets huge. I mean, I'm leaving that aside because it just automatically gets a, it, it's there every year. It gets a huge audience anyway, and it's, it's like a newsworthy story in itself. But that mm. aside, I mean, that year it was just like it was man, it was a man who only express. But my God, it's no surprise. Mm. The, fun, the funny thing is, the following year, the Christmas Day episode of EastEnders nineteen to six had Den and Nanji on the Orient Express. So whether or not Frankie really the, the, the production team at EastEnders were paying attention to that, I don't, I, I don't know. But that's that like was, that's like with Wonder Woman, where they had. Uh... Roller Coaster, the film in 1977, Kiss Meets the Family of the Park in 1978. Um, in 1979, they had uh, uh, The Phantom of the Roller Coaster or something like that, which was a, a hybrid of both of those. Which, Are they know, all at Magic Mountain, the same park? I, I don't know. I've got the bo- the Wonder Woman box six. It cost me $2, um, mm-hmm. literally, and I've not That's seen it. Number. But I, I, I will. It, you know, I don't think I'll go up Magic Mountain because it'd just be too obvious but it would be something close to it, I'd imagine. But uh, anyway, let's get into Mind on the Orient Express before we just absolutely do not get into it at all. Uh, so we've got Dennis Waterman is Terry McCann, obviously George Cole is Arthur Daly. Uh, Clint Edwards always as uh, Dave at the bar. Tell me about some of the other people here, you two. Uh, Honor Blackman, obviously we know from various things, obviously Goldfinger being the most obvious one. Uh, Adam Faith, Faith. That's, that's the singer, isn't it? Adam Faith? Yeah, 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 yeah. Right, right. Uh, Amanda okay, Seed. So, yeah. Um, Ralph Faith. Was watching, but not quite. So. Yeah. Um, Amanda Pays. I don't know much about her, who played Nikki. Oh, she married, oh, she married Corbin. She, uh, she did Max, Max Hedrum a, a couple of months later. She married Corbin Burnson. Um, yeah, oh, really? She, she retired from acting a couple of years ago, went to real estate. Uh, so I don't think she's going to miss that. Um, but yeah, this is just like Terry. Do you play? Do you play Terry's love interest, which is just like a convention of the show, which is to say Terry would fall in love, but it wouldn't really quite work out, and it wasn't really Terry's fault. I mean, the best example I can think of is there's an episode of season three where Terry falls in love with a musician played by Susie Quattro. Right. But it falls apart because the, her character basically gets involved in drugs, and Terry just won't have anything to do with it. I mean, I will say this. I mean, Susie Quattro must be the only person I can think of. You appeared in both Mind and Happy Days. And yeah. I think that's I think that's a remarkable achievement in itself. But I don't um, think people realise how massive Susie Quattro was in the seventies. Oh, oh, she's she's. I'll tell you what she's doing at this moment in time. She's touring. She's on tour with the nostalgia circuit. Yeah, um, I, no, no, no I did see. I, I, as awful as it is, I think I've mentioned before. I did see Susie Quattro, and I walked out. I thought this is just Grandma Rock. It's just yeah, the energy yeah. wasn't there. And okay, I understand at the time she had literally just become a grandmother. She was. I think 51 or something at the time, which is close to you know, uh, all our ages, actually. It's actually nice that there's somebody on the show who's at the same age as uh, John and I, yeah. uh, or, or thereabouts. Yeah, Hunter's no, younger than son. She, so. No, she reminds me. She reminds, for whatever reason, she reminds me of Leah Remini. I don't even know why. It's just like every time I see her, she, she does look like her. <laughs> she, she does. Well, to me, anyway, I'm in blind. Yeah, yeah. Um, so anyway, 
uh, obviously Anna Blackman, uh, who, you know what? Honestly, I didn't realize was 38 when she made Goldfinger. She didn't look it. No, she's older than Connery. Yeah. She aged well. She's really it's incredible. Um, who else we got? Now, we've also got, uh, tell me about this woman, Nez, uh, Debbie Arnold. Do you know yeah, she she was a paid free model until she went into um acting. I think she's again. I think she's retired. She pop up now and again in the eighties as um basically as the, the in house sick on dumb blonde. Um, and she's just like, oh look, she's got a tits out. Oh well, what a surprise. Um, mm. yeah, she's she's. I'm, I'm guessing she's long retired though. I haven't Do seen you, her in like that. That uh, it seemed to be a bit racy in a few scenes of her coming yeah. out with the uh, you know, pretty much a corset and a brazier and. <laughs> I thought, holy shit! I mean, there's not nothing wrong. I was more than happy to see it, but yeah. holy shit! It was, like no. it was like a convention this year, and you had to have. It's like um, somebody, somebody saying to Terry McCann, "So, did, didn't I see you boxing Wormwood Scrubs? You were a bit tasty as a boxer, I'll tell." I yeah, like, oh, this lots, lots of that. <clears throat> yeah. Um, also, we've got in this cast. Uh, oh, who else we got James Coombs. Uh, Ronald Lacey. Oh, I mean, he, he at the time was just a Mad Mission film in Hong Kong. Yeah? Yeah, yeah Mad, Mission, it, it, Mad Mission 4. He did uh, Aces Go Places 4. Yeah, yeah, that's it. Did that's he really? It. Yeah. Ooh. Or Mad Mission, You Never Die Twice, I think was the title. For export. <laughs> the, the title the Germans gave it, because they were the ones who packaged the English versions. Mm. Okay. We call them the Mad Missions, yeah. Right. So... Anyway, Ralph uh, Bates is in it. <laughs> Ralph, yeah, Ralph Bates. Where do we know him from? I know the name. Hammer films. I, I know him from the Hammer stuff, like uh, Dr. Jekyll and Sister Hyde and uh, oh. Horror of Frankenstein. There's a he, few he, others, I think. He, he just at the time he was in um, the English version of Dear John for, uh, for the BBC, uh, which again ran for a couple mm. of years. Um, I remember that yeah. show. Yeah, yeah. Dear John. It, it, it was remade by, uh, by a US network. I don't know how yeah. long that lasted, though. Mm. And um, so anyway, we've got uh, Terry and Arthur, and what a team! Honestly, George Cole and Dennis Waterman. I mean, just to the chemistry is incredible. Those two. Yeah. Oh, oh God, yeah. I wonder. I wonder did they actually get along in real life? Yeah. 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 Oh God. Yeah. They, they just. They just. They, they just deeply respected each other. Um, yeah. I mean, the thing to bear in mind, just respect and nothing is that the first seat, the first season went out in nineteen eighty. Um, and the critics just didn't like it at all. And they, they, the reason they didn't like it was they just they, they didn't know what it was. It's a, it's a comedy, it's a drama, it's a crime, um, it's an action, and it generally they generally just didn't know what it was. But, but of course, the public didn't wait for their didn't wait for their validation because the first season was 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 a hit. I mean, it was very successful. Um, Thames TV just automatically greenlit the second season. Halfway through its run, um, they were really impressed. I mean, the public didn't wait to be led by the nose by TV critics. It, 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 yeah, okay, we get it. We know what it's. It's a bit of comedy, a bit of action, maybe a bit of TNA, mm. um, a bit of drama, maybe a bit of love, in, bit of a love interest. And yeah, it, but but the balance was fantastic. It, mm -hmm. it was so good that tel TV critics were just were just confused. They, they didn't know what it was. It, it was only with the second season that they thought, yeah, okay, we. We get it. We know what it is. It's 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 it's, it's a balancing act, and it works. Yeah, I've always wondered, and we will get into this film. Honestly, I just got a few questions. I've always wondered why Americans tend to have twenty-two episodes or twenty-four per season, yet the Brits always have what is it? There's six usually. Yeah, yeah, six, usually usually six. It's, oh, there's such a huge difference in in numbers. Well, it's it's like it's like the whole idea of. Of, of, of an English sitcom basically using the one writer's like six episodes. There's there's no staff room, um, there's no pool of writers, it's just one guy on his own knocking it out for six for, for six, six episodes and nothing else. It's like it's like Eddie Braven basically writing for Morecambe and Wise like for years, and it was just him and him alone. There wasn't like like 15, 16 writers that Morecambe and Wise would use. It was just one guy in his house, he didn't do interviews. Uh, it was just like just like a, you, the only thing you knew of Eddie Brain was that you saw his credits on, on at the end of the Morgan and Wise Christmas special, and that was it. But he, right. it was just it was like there was nobody else. Um, they, they they just swore by him. John, what's the go with the American one? Do you know why they mass produced so many for a season? I think it's because it's derived from radio. 
uh, radio programs, old time radio before television, where you did have a large staff of writers to write radio shows every week. Right. And I think the production model for TV shows was kind of based on that. And so they never got this idea that the writer creates the show or is the auteur of the show. You know, uh, it's kind of like, no, we have a staff of writers and, they, and we have a formula. We have a format. That's why you can have 30 episodes of The Fugitive in one season. And it's all about, you know, really the main story of him chasing the one-armed man and escaping as Spectre Gerard is not really the story of every episode. It's mostly goes to a town, gets involved in a situation and mm. helps resolve it and then moves on. You know, Gerard comes in at the end and chases him or, or whatever. Yeah. So that's I've noticed I've been going back and watching a lot of old TV shows, a lot of old Westerns and such. And I realized a lot of it, something like Gunsmoke, James Arnez and, um, and you know, Matt Dillon and Kitty and uh, Fester or Chester or whatever. Um, Burt Reynolds character, Quentin. Uh, they're kind of like wraparound segments for the guest stars. It's really for the guest stars to show off their acting. Like Ernest Borgnine is the guest this week and mm. he has his own little drama. And it might even be based on a cheap uh, Western paperback novel, but that I just noticed that's how they formatted it and they never changed. Um, I think you're seeing a difference Maybe post Sopranos, you're seeing more creator driven shows. I don't know if that's really a good thing for America because I don't think our show formats really benefit from different writers, you know, in, in something like this, like trying to do something like a British show where mm -hmm. it's only nine episodes or whatever. I don't, I don't think it works out well at all. God, look at Lost. Jesus. Mm -hmm. Like, <laughs> you got a whole staff of writers and you can't even come up with an ending. Oh, they're all dead. Screw it. You know, it's like Americans. <laughs> I, I mean, there's something I've always thought going back and watching these old shows. I really feel like 70s British television was like the golden age of TV. Mm. It was very, oh, I agree. very totally well agree. written, very well acted. You well, could, well, you bear, could, bear in mind, John, that there were only three, t up yeah. until the CCT, there were, there were only three national TV channels. Lit and the old, and the old closed yeah. down at midnight. Nice. And they, 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 you, you, get, you get the midnight. National Anthem, there it is, closed down, and that's it. That's until 9 a.m. in the morning. And 9 a.m. in the morning of a weekday morning, which is like education program for skills. It's not like right. it would be anything to actually watch, unless because, like, like oh, you know, I'm kind of in prison here, to be honest. So I wouldn't watch, oh, oh, a documentary on World War One. Well, that's, that's okay. Um, that's <laughs> it. It's just like there'll be nothing to watch until it, and then you have, like, you'd have the lunchtime news, and then the, the, the ITV readers would just basically break off and do their own thing. and BBC One would just like show programs for kids, and BBC Two would be a test card. Remember the gag in American World for London, where the David Norton character gets to his motel room in London, and he switches on the TV, and it's just like, oh yeah, British television is like the best in the world. Like, what have we got? Like three channels. One's a test card, one's one's a dart contest, and the other one's a TV commercial for the news of the world. And it's like that's it. It's no exaggeration. It's just like, yeah. It's just like, it, oh, it, it, I think the reason is because it was so, because when you had your dramas on, that was the cream of the crop. That was the best that was going to get on in the entire country for the writers and directors and so oh, it, it sounds like Alistair Cook. It's Alistair Cook sitting in a red leather armchair yeah. uh, with, with, with a glass of port and a roaring bonfire <laughs> and an Irish wolfhound uh, introducing an episode of bloody, oh my God, Brides and Revisited or something. It's just like, that's the, that's the way I. It probably was like that, but it could be wrong. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So anyway, um, we will now finally get into Mind on the Orient Express as a review. Uh, it starts off with uh, Terry and Arthur. Well, Arthur witnesses a, what, a, a, a you know, a, a, a bit of a bash up inside a, uh, what is it? A Arcade. Yeah. Complete, complete with Penny Fountain. Right, eh? uh, and he's basically told that uh, if he mentions anything, they, they find out that he was there, he mentions anything about it, he's going to uh, sort of meet with a you know, bit of a twist of fate. Meanwhile, Terry is courting this young lady who's who she played by. Uh, oh, god, knows. So, so Linda, uh, Linda Haynes, or right, right, yeah, that's her, yeah, um. And uh, Terry notices one night a woman being mugged and intervenes, managed to get the mugger off the lady who turned out to be the daughter of a very wealthy crime lord. Do we do see the prologue or the uh, uh, the uh, prologue at the yeah, start? Ten, ten, ten years previously. Ten years previously, yeah, correct. Uh, so we see that 
the, the crime lord has been obviously i guess it's poisoned by his wife or by somebody or by uh, you know another crime figure uh managed to write down on a piece of paper uh we don't know what we don't see it and it is he goes to his daughter's room and puts it into the locket on her, on her chain and she's wearing 10 years later we get into the what i just mentioned about arthur witnessing this uh you know, sort of uh, these heavies roughing this guy up and Terry intervening this mugging uh, by this woman who turns out to be that daughter that we do see 10 years previously with the locket. And uh, she holds the the numbers to a sw uh, Swiss bank account in Zurich with a lot of money stashed away. So she's only got half of it. Yeah, yeah, that's correct. As a thank you to Terry, she... Uh, Gives him two tickets to the Orient Express, travel on the Orient Express, um, which is not a Chinese takeaway, by the way. That, that made me laugh. That made me laugh. Uh, it could have been Lee Ho Fuchs. Yeah. <sighs> there must be anyway, like five, uh, five, five Chinese restaurants in Soho, but the name Lee Ho Fuchs. Oh, Did really? Oh, oh, God, yeah. Yeah. It's Jesus. Um, so, anyway. Terry is meant to go with his uh, lady friend, but Arthur, in his classic way, he's a swindle that, swindle her out of that and get himself on the Orient Express to avoid being subpoenaed. And I dare say for the holiday as well. And then it basically follows the murder on... I've never seen Murder on the Orient Express, ever. Oh, I, love I love that film. Never seen it. There's various it's versions, good. isn't there? It's the 74 version of Sydney Limit, which is the, written by Paul Dane, who wrote Goldfinger. Um, and Sydney Limit always used to make the point because the hardest film he ever made because lightness of touch was just difficult. And he, he, up until 1974, when he made it, he made three films previously, which he buggered up because it was just like so hard. It's just like just, just to get that balance right. And yeah, it's, it's, I mean, he made that film in between, in between Serpico and Dog the Afternoon, and you just never guess. It literally just never gets. It just, it just sticks it like a sore thumb. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so anyway, we get onto the Orient Express, and it's basically you can't trust anybody on there. You don't know who the who, who the hell's who. You know, you think even the uh, most uh, sort of uh, regal uh, of women, played by Honor Blackman, even she's in. She wants something out of it. So yeah, it's it's all over the place. Uh, John. Obviously, first time view for you and a first time for mm -hmm. me, but I was very familiar with Minder, uh, probably a bit more than you were. What did you think of this? Um, I found it amusing and um, it's uh, it's it's pretty entertaining. It's never boring to me. I, having only just seen the first season of Minder, I knew enough to kind of go along with it, even if I was a little baffled by some of the stuff in it, because I just haven't seen enough episodes to be on the up and up, you know, and this was uh, clearly... I, I, I guess it was meant to be like a season finale of sorts of, or something because I've been reading up on it. And it, other than being this Christmas special, it seems like it capped it off for the year or, or something like that. I don't know. Mm. Um, but I found it, um, it's, it's really fun. It's got the fight. It, it'll have a fight scene or it'll have a really funny scene or it'll have a, a really neat kind of swindling, uh, you know, conniving scene where they get out of something being street smart. Um, the funny thing is I watched it yesterday morning on that real blurry, smeary YouTube oh. upload. And I honestly couldn't make out half of the program. And then when I got a better copy of it this morning and watched it, I was like, okay, now I'm getting these jokes that I couldn't really understand yeah. on the YouTube version. Like, yeah. I do uh, say, don't watch that YouTube upload if you want to check this it's out. It's unwatchable. Get a hold of that. I think it's season four box set you need that it has it on there. But, uh, but uh, it was... It's very entertaining. Uh, Amanda Pays, I really like seeing her because uh, I was a fan of her TV work in America on The Flash and I think L.A. Law, she was on there and she was in the this uh, monster movie I liked quite a lot. Um, well, what the hell Bible? is it called? It's yeah, yeah, you you know, uh, Anthony. Um, the what the hell is it? The end of Walter Kindred. Kindred. Alien. Yeah, yeah, The Kindred. Yeah, she, and I didn't see Max Headroom, so I wasn't familiar with her work on that. But uh, but The Kindred, I, I I liked her in that. She turned into a fish. Yeah, <laughs> uh, not to give away too much. But um, but I, I always liked her, and um, it was cool to see Ralph Bates uh, in in kind of a small role. He didn't look well, and I, and I Anthony, mean, you had said he died of cancer like yeah, a year yeah, after this. Yeah, hopefully he's sad. Mm. Yeah, real sad. I know he died young, and uh, he didn't look he didn't look well here. But he it was it was good to see him. 
uh honor blackman i thought it was really fun to see her on this um the whole orient express setting of course when you, if you have a fight scene or a suspense scene it reminds you of from russia with love yeah yeah uh, one of my favorite bond films so that it kind of makes it fun in that aspect i guess to it gives it more of that okay this is a tv special movie episode you know so they give you a more I, i'm guessing it was all done on location but um you know i don't know europe very well at all so um i i kind of really just dug that um there was giving you more you could have released this in theaters probably in countries where minder was moderately well known i don't think you could release it in america as far as i know this was never shown over here um in, in not even state. on public tv public access no um public tv favored snobby english shows I like like the like kind of upstairs downstairs or whatever masterpiece theater type stuff they didn't or they didn't show life. like working class crime or action <laughs> or anything like that we never got as far as i know we never got the professionals we didn't even get department s um i i did hear that a new york station ran some of those shows so maybe there was a little more experimentation in the northeast but uh for the most part british shows were seen as snobby entertainment you know oh, I, I, I think if you just shown stuff like the swim your mind on on, on american television it, it, it would have been baffling. I suspect it would have been just bad. It was just like, what is it? We wouldn't be able to understand it. It's what like, talking about? what's going on? It's, yeah. It's like Andy Cap comic strips. Like, most people don't get those at all. And maybe they don't even get them in England. But, um, well, our, well, well, our Andy Cap or your Andy Cap? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there was, a, there, was a, there was a TV adaptation in the early 80s of the Andy Cap comic strip with James Bowman's Andy Cap. Uh, really? I haven't seen it like 35 years. It's, it's on DVD, if I recall. But I oh, wow. that long. Um, I mean, he, he does he did kind of look like him. Uh, it, it, it's just like, the, oh, the, there's James Bond wearing the cloth cap and the suit, and it's just like, just, just, and it's just like, it, it, it does actually work, to be honest. I mean, it, it shouldn't, but it does. I mean, why me? Yeah, I mean, sure, you should, you should that outside of being, it just goes for nothing. And it's bloody hell. Right. Yeah, so, yeah, but anyway, the, the Sweeney, nobody would have understood. Minder might have had a cult following if it was shown over here, but they didn't even give it a chance as far as I know. The, mo the most accessible would have been the professionals. Yes. Yeah. And I, and I think Brian Clemens was always trying to sell it to like HBO or, and mm. eventually I think I mentioned on the old show, HBO did released two episodes on VHS, which is the most baffling thing. Like maybe they, okay, we'll see how it does on video. Maybe we'll air it on HBO one month and they never did. But, but yeah, yeah I think the professionals would have done really well. Yeah. But uh, anyway, so on the Minder on the Orient Express, the uh, main item or the main main part of the film is an envelope. The MacGuffin. The MacGuffin, <laughs> yeah, which uh, seems to get passed around from uh, person to person through various ways. And um, yeah, it's just a, uh, you know, it's great. It's a great ride of a film, pun intended, that, um, you know. Patrick Malahide is Chisholm. Um, yeah, yeah, it wasn't familiar with that guy. What, what do we know about him? Yeah, he, 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 oh, he's he, he's just like a one-standing character. It's like he's been popping up stuff in in English television for like the last forty. He he made two appearances in the Sweeney. Um, he did one episode in season four, and he also did, he, he popped up as a bond disposal officer in Sweeney too. Um, but it's just it's just like it's just the, only, the only time I'm going to think that ever happened. But yeah, he was he was in the scene detective, and he. He got into a bit of bother because it was a scene, it was a sex scene where he had to basically show his ass. Oh, and really? It, it, it became so notorious that he would he, he wouldn't he, every any time a TV program wanted to basically show that clip of the sex scene of that sex scene from the scene detective, he wouldn't sign off on it because it's just like I don't want to talk about this now. It's just like I don't want to I don't want to see my ass shown on English television ever again. Oh, it's an ass. Who cares? Dennis, Dennis, Dennis Potter or no Dennis Potter, I'm not doing it. And I mean, if you get, if you, I mean, if you interview him and get him onto the subject of the scene detective, he, he just clams up. He just wouldn't talk about it. It's just like, no, no, no. So oh, anyway. I'll tell you what was funny was there was one joke. I'm, I'm guessing it was a joke. I certainly noticed it was when um, Chisholm first meets his French counterpart from Interpol or Interplod, which, oh man, that made me <laughs> laugh when I heard uh, uh, George Cole say it later when he's obviously, you know, concussed. Um, and the French detective has got a green drink in front of him. Crème de Monf. Crème de Monf, yeah. But green drink, French, frogs, green frogs, <laughs> green drink. 
don't know if that was intended, but it's, it oh, made oh, me yeah, laugh. I'm, I'm yeah, guessing. it totally was, yeah. But, um, I mean, yeah, I, mean I, I personally really enjoyed this one. I don't think I'd ever seen it. I'd seen the VHS around for since forever. Um, it even got a rental here in the 80s. Got a, at least one uh, home video release. And whether the DVD did or not, I don't know. Um, that box that you sent me, Anthony, it's not in there, unfortunately. No, no. Well, I mean, the thing to be of there were two minor Christmas specials. One was Man with the Orient Express. And the second one was like back in 1983, which is just like a compilation episode consisting of Terry and Arthur in the Winchester trying to basically hook up a, a Christmas tree with lights. And Terry would basically remind Arthur of, um, of a dodgy deal that went wrong. And Arthur would have a flashback. I mean, oh, I mean right. it, 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 yeah. if, you, if you haven't seen it, you wouldn't miss it. It's just basically a compilation episode. Yeah. It's one of those, they film it in a day, you know, get yeah, this done. Yeah, we'll yeah, insert the yeah. flashbacks. It's like the Sanford and Son where they go camping and they just go, hey, remember when? And they just flash back to it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But um, yeah, this is an enjoyable film. I, I really did like it. Uh, as I said, I, I've seen it around, but never just seen it. Um, I did like Minder. As I said, the old man loved Minder. It was just, it was a, a, a to be seen every week for him. And um, but I was more. I really like Only Fools and Horses more. It's it's the same, but it's different. Yeah, you know, it's about a couple of you know Cockney swindlers and you know especially Del Boy by uh, Sir David Jason. Yeah, the Finterbury Man said the first the first three four seasons of. Only Fools and Horses weren't really all that, all that successful. It, it took a number of years. I mean, the attitude of the BBC was, it's still in the cases that if a, if a programme doesn't work, it's not our fault, it's yours, and we're going to keep on making it till you bloody well like it. And, and they, no, honestly, it's, it's like they, it, it took for, I mean, when we think of Only Fools and Horses today, we think of it predominantly in the 1990s. We don't think of it in the 1980s because... By the late 1980s, it, it, it found its audience, but my God, it took a couple of years. I mean, yeah, I mean, it, 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 its audience really just struggled. But the, the, again, six episodes a season, all written by John Selden. But the, but the BBC just like, stick it out. Just, and, they, and they still do it, by the way. It's just, it's just like the fucking arrogance of the organisation is just untrue. But that's how, that's how they are. And it, it came good. Uh, but whereas in the case of mine, it was just a success from season one. They didn't yeah. have any problem whatsoever. I, I will um, not. I will not buy that only fools and horses box set till it's completely uncut. Yeah. Absolutely no. I will. No, not I, want, touch I it. want to clarify for American listeners: this show you're talking about, this uh, horses show, that was the BBC like rival to Minder. Yeah, yeah. One, one, one was forty-five minutes long. Whereas only fools was like a, a conventional thirty-minute sitcom. Thirty minutes sitcom. But I, I don't think any. I think I don't think anything. Anybody thought them in those times. Just they're just two different shows. It's like you, you'd have, say, for example, the Sweeney going out on a Monday evening in the autumn. You'd have the professionals going out on the Sunday evening, and you and you watch both shows and they're both very good. But you'd be under no illusions. They were just two very different shows altogether. But they yeah. were just the same audience, and they, and they get the same audience. Yeah. But they're just two different things altogether. Two different Where, sensibilities. Whereas Minder had comedy. You know, moments of comedy with moments of action, whereas Only Fools and Horses is just straight up comedy, yeah, and it's, yeah, it is yeah. very, very funny. I think, John, if you watched it, you'd really, you'd really latch onto it. It is very so accessible. I have, to look, I have to look for a deal on uh, the DVD sets and everything because prices yeah. shot up at Amazon UK about importing stuff. So, oh, really? On eBay, yeah, got pretty bad. Even as a Prime member, yeah, even as a Prime member, the um, it's like fifteen dollars to ship like one DVD over here. Yeah, yeah ever since the pandemic, they it used to be four bucks, and now ever since the pandemic, they just shipping prices went nuts. And uh, so a lot of times, but I can usually get it decently from like a supplier like Rare Waves, that's a, a UK supplier. Yeah, they, they uh, sell stuff reasonably. I, I see them a lot, but I I was thinking to myself, eh, I don't know what they're like. Sometimes I've had a bum deal from them. Most of the time, they're pretty good. But I remember I was getting that um, one of those ITC shows uh the one with the the old all the old people it was like um it was an american actor brian keith or oh, the zoo gang yeah zoo gang zoo gang and it took a year to get my blu-ray of the zoo gang but uh -huh. i had to cancel and file a refund with uh rare waves and get it from somebody else but it took oh, wow. forever and uh yeah rare waves was bad about that but everything else i've been pretty good with 
-hmm. but most of the time I just order them directly from like say the British DVD company like 88 films or whatever and they're pretty reasonable like they won't even charge you shipping so Amazon's doing some um, some swindling shit I think of course they are because if Eureka can send me stuff with no shipping charge it's like well what the what's Amazon doing with the fifteen dollars you know or 1399 GBP, well. that's what they call it. But it's like 15, 16 bucks. Yeah. Yeah. I still really like ordering from Amazon UK directly because uh the, the shipping was very, very cheap. And also the VAT be taken out for myself being, you know, yeah. from Australia. Same um, here. That used to happen, but they they screwed that up for me, at least for Americans. Yeah. These days now, I just bum, basically bombard Amphi. So, oh, Nez, can you get this to your place? Like, <laughs> honestly, honestly, haven't they, haven't they sorted the, the, whole, the whole thing out yet? I mean, whereby, frankly, um, the dispute between the Australian government and, and, and Bezos, I mean, haven't they, like, was that still ongoing? I mean, they've, they've sorted it out. Um, but, yeah, you know, I think they, they put the reins on him a bit and said, well, you're not going to have complete free reign. You are going to conform but that was that government unfortunately we've got a fucking new government oh shit uh, yeah oh, okay. conservatives are gone as of saturday night now we've got the left in and god fucking help us all i just uh yeah, yeah. In, in, a, in a year's time it'll, the, 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 the globe will have gone um for, 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 for him fucking fucking blank slate and, and he yeah. is a blank slate to be honest god he's just hopeless absolutely hopeless yeah yeah when I saw this morning, I saw the swearing in of Albanese. I wanted to put my fucking fist through the table. I'm surprised you didn't screw it up. It's just like, I don't know where I am. Where, 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 what is this? I can't oh, you should have seen, mate, you should have seen Saturday night. I was in the absolute foulest of moods. Everyone, yeah. but the wife just said, stay away from dad. He's just not in a good mood. I was like, oh, fuck this. I was, I was telling you, Anthony, I was watching a, I was so depressed. I was watching a documentary about uh, Jimmy Savile. I was just, I thought, oh, <laughs> I'd rather watch a bloody, you know, a Savile no, documentary. No, 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 no. Yeah, there's there's one absolute cunt of a human being, I tell you, right there. What a prick. In, 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 in 18 months' time, they'll be begging for a liberal government. They'll be begging for the return of the liberals. Uh, just, just give them enough rope, and, you know, it'll fuck well, it all up. Yeah. Well, at least that bitch Keneally's gone. The, one yeah, of the mean yeah, girls is gone. You. She was horrifying. Fucking asshole. Uh, anyway, it's an okay. Me, me, me and Nez could speak politics for fucking hours. Uh-huh. We don't have that. So, <laughs> so I can I can add for American listeners, only fools and horses uh is available at Amazon US for 40 about 45 bucks. And uh it's also streaming on Britbox all nine seasons. So it is accessible. Yeah. yeah. I just found we real quick before we get back in the mind of that, the only fools and horses with uh Granddad were hysterical when they had Uncle Albert. They were, they were okay, but with um, what was the guy's name, oh, Anthony? Leonard Pierce. Oh, Leonard Pierce. Well, Leonard Pierce played Granddad, then he died after like season three, and yeah. then he had the replacement. So, um, Buster Merrifield came in as Uncle Albert. Mm. Uh, I mean, it, I mean, you can argue which one was basically the best, um, but yeah, oh, but Granddad so just carried on, yeah. You had to have somebody, but Jesus Christ, Leonard Pierce was oh. He used to bring me to tears. He was that funny. Christ he didn't. Was... He, he, he wasn't required to do an awful lot, but he just did it very well. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Just sit, just sit, just, just play the game. Just sit in the armchair and complain. Words. That's it. And watch and watch your three TVs at the same time. Yeah, yeah. Three, three TV channels with fuck all on. Yeah, off you, off you go, Granddad. <laughs> <laughs> Have fun. You copy of the Linton Post. That was yeah. That was that was the joke. He'd watch three TVs at one time. Yeah, I wonder if uh, Alan Moore pinched that for Ozymandias when he had all the multiple <laughs> friends for Watchmen. <laughs> hmm. We did. We only fools and horses fan, but uh, yeah. Anyway, real quick, Anthony, when did you see this film? Obviously, when it aired in '85. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was a big deal. Um, I mean, Christmas Day is it, it always Christmas Day was always a big, always a big deal. This is before like Channel Four um, in 1982. But yeah, I mean, it was just, it was just like. Go and watch it. You got to. If you can't watch it, it's just like I'll 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 set the videos to record it so that you 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 will get it one way or another. Um, but yeah, yeah, it was just like it just scored. It just scored so 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 such a huge rating number for for ICB. It's just like he surprised it didn't do it again. 
but that was it. It was just there was just two Christmas ep- two Christmas Day episodes. That was it, and you didn't. Get, and they, they they really should have done it again, but alas, nonetheless. Um, but yeah, it was just like it was just, just for Eastern films. That was just like as good as it got. After that, it was just like it just kind of tapered off, and then the Waterman years came to an end. Mm. And, then, and then and then they made the horrible mistake of bringing it back. Um, it's just Are like, you telling me you tried watching it with the new fellow oh, you couldn't get through it? Oh, Gary, Gary Webster. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Gary, and it was just the ratings was just like not okay, but they weren't they weren't they weren't that. Um, well, you can't catch yeah. lightning in a bottle two times in a row with no. like I mean, I'll, I'll, I mean, I'll, I'll have to mind that Eastern films really struggle because it's just like they started to branch out into things with just like. I mean, the entire point about Eastern films is that it was created by Thames TV in the early seventies, specifically to create dra- drama for, from the, for and from the Lon- the London catchment area, and specific and, and that and that was it. So it was just like Sweeney London, Minder London, Danger XP London, Out London, uh, and then it started to get silly and it started to branch out to doing other things that frankly just just the last thing you would expect them to make. But you know that that's the that's the direction they went, in, and it just didn't work at all. They made. They made they made a very good they made a very good dra- comedy drama in the early eighties for Channel Four called Prospects. It's on YouTube. It's kind of an, it's kind of like a younger it's kind of minor for a younger audience. It's it's in that manner. It's worth checking out. It's pretty good. Um, it sounds like six or eight episodes, but yeah, yeah. Just for our audience who are listening and not watching, it looks like at the moment John is on a treadmill. <laughs> Got to see this. I don't know what the hell he's doing, but. It literally looks like John is on a treadmill. I had the had to let one of the cats out of his feeding room. He had to be fed separately from the others. Oh, okay then. Because he's aggressive and tries to steal everybody's food. So mm. yeah, it was just a yeah. Very uh stroking his cat like Blofeld and you only live twice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Anyway, look, there's not a great deal to this film. It is enjoyable. Oh, um, just real quick, were any of the episodes of Mind a cut when they released home video? No, not, not as far as I'm aware. Hmm. Um, no, I mean, I, I, I recall back in the late 80s, Mind only on Assist did actually get a standalone VHS release. Um, I, I think there was one gag cut, but I can't imagine why it was just an office. It's the gag, it's a gag where Chisholm goes to the buffet and he buys, he orders the ham sandwich and the beer and he, and he gets the, the, the can of beer. And a ham sandwich, and it just looks like like fifteen quid. It's like fifteen quid for a ham sandwich and a can of beer. So I thought, are you kidding? And it's like, like but whatever reason, it was cut. It's not there in the episode. I can't, I can't yeah. for the life of me imagine why. But unless, I, I, but I, do, I, do, I do remember that guy going out on, on the night. Um, yeah. But for whatever reason, it's just it's not there. Jeez, that's weird. It's, there's no reason yeah, to cut that. I, I mean, we only, we know only fools and horses is cut for some pretty strong. You know, uh, racial. Well, that was, that, that, that was never that in, in the nineteen eighties. It was never a watershed. It always would go out like eight, 8 p.m. over Thursday evening. It was never in the nineteen eighties. It was never a watershed. It was only like when it got to the 90, early nineteen nineties. It went out after nine p.m. So the, John Sullivan probably got away with a little bit more. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it's just like it, it wasn't a watershed show. But then, then, then it became one. Yeah. Whether it made any difference, or not, I don't know. Yeah, but. Uh... I mean, this thing runs 106 minutes, which when I first looked, I thought, oh, that's, that's quite lengthy for, you know, but it is basically pretty much a couple of minor episodes stitched together at that running time, I should say, not the not the yeah. feel of the film. But uh, for me, I watched it, geez, I popped on about quarter past 20, half past 12 at night, just jumped to bed and watched them one sitting. I thought, I, I can't, I can't stop this now. And then, watch the rest of it. I want to want to see the rest now and uh get out of the way. So I was that I was that enthralled with it. I mean it's it's a lighthearted fun. It's uh you know it, it's a good representation of what Minder is if you were to watch this film first uh, and then dive into the series. It doesn't deviate deviate away so far that it, it feels like its own entity and then the show is something else altogether. Yeah. I mean, I mean, if you see, if you're the watch, see, for example, I either start with the film or go back to see the first episode of the season one, Gunfights of the OK Laundress. Yeah. Terry gets, Terry gets involved in the hostage siege, um, and, and and it kind of goes a bit pear shaped. It's 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 fine either way, whichever way you whichever way you want to go. Uh, because yeah. the first episode is like 
It's just a perfect representation of every episode and every season that follows. They're all they're all like that. And they're all in that manner. They're yeah. all in that spirit, and they, they, they just work. Um, I, th- I think if you were to not like it, frankly, I think you'd be hard. I think it'd be hard, pl- hard, hard to please. To be a perfect, it just lays it all on. I just think I just think that it's going to um, translate a lot more different to American audiences than what it will to Australia. Australians will get it. Younger generation yeah. of Australians will struggle because they're so used now to just everything being so quickly mass produced and it's everything's so quick and it's all these fast edits and yeah you know, the uh cast just say the word like 10 times in every sentence and it's <laughs> it's unlistenable and unwatchable um for instance <laughs> yeah some youtubers content creators i was watching one today this i they were just saying like like i had to switch it off i just couldn't yeah, take it yeah millennials yeah, yeah, just the, have no grasp of the English language properly. You do find that you do find that lots of millennials on YouTube. They do like to specialize in watching English TV shows for the first time, and it's just like it, it blows the fucking minds. It's just, just like, yeah. oh, oh, we're gonna watch an episode of something that you might have heard of called Only Fools and Horses, and they watch it's just like, what is this? I mean, they like it, but it's just like, this is just like this is just like such a, such a culture shock. It's just like. Bloody hell! It's like, it's like they now and again you'll see a review. There's an old two Ronnie sketch called Four Candles. It's it's the one where Ronnie Barker goes to the hardware shop and he asks for four candles, but it, it doesn't mean four candles. It means something else. And you'll get American millennial American millennials watching the sketch, and it's just like it just blows the fucking mind. It just literally just like what is what is this? Yeah. Uh, which, which which one is the two? Which, which one is Ronnie? And it's just like, well, they're both Ronnie. They're both Ronnie, yeah. Ronnie Court, Ronnie both- Barker. <laughs> That's why it's called the two Ronnies. It's I'm not some- one man with a split personality, it's two Ronnies. From some whiny show called the two Ronnie. Anyway, let's up, let's let's give it a look. And they do, and it's just like bloody hell. I mean, you can you can see them on YouTube, but yeah, I don't yeah. think it'll surprise you. Th- those reaction ones though, they're not watching the show properly because they're also conscious they're on video while they're watching a show. Yeah, yeah. They're I mean, not you- off camera, invested in what yeah, they're watching. I mean, one, of the, one of the things you'll find with millennials on YouTube is that it's just the same things all over again. Oh, let's review John Carpenter's remake of The Thing. Let's review Empire Strikes Back. Let's review, and it's just like the same thing all over. It's just like it's like six films on rotation because and, they those and we're all watching the same six films. But the thing is, Anthony, those bring in views. If you got yeah. Empire Strikes Back in the title or in the tags. Yeah, yeah, it's going to bring in views. Views mean money by yeah. paper. So no one is going to say do a reaction video to uh, mutiny on the buses because who the hell is going to watch that? I tell, I tell you, I like watching that. I, I like watching millennials watch for the first time. Hacksaw Ridge and Saber Private Ryan just to see the looks of horror in the faces. It's just like it's I've just, never seen and, it, and, and, and it is literally horror. It's just like yeah, it's just like the silence. I can't just, believe they made this. It's just like yeah. oh my oh my god the, oh my god the horror the horror yeah. somebody take it away oh my god what oh my and this is it's just it's just like like male viewers. Where did you get to the female millennials? It's just like you only you need a mental breakdown. This is a kind of, this is get, get them watching, get them reacting to a black exploitation film. <laughs> yeah. With all the language and the uh black shampoo. Yeah, yeah. And stuff like that. Is, is Tinted Brass as Caligula? It's all yours. Enjoy. Knock yourself out. Stick that on YouTube, well. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. All right. Anyway, let's let's uh rate Minder on the Orient Express. Uh guess first, Nez. I'll, I'll give a four star of the five. And the reason I give a four star of the five, as I mentioned you to you last week, I miss the fiend tune. I just so miss the fiend tune. <laughs> so miss the bloody fiend tune. Yeah, I know, but I, I, I get it. Of the show. It's just, yeah. I, I, I actually understand why they didn't put the theme in it because then it would just feel like, oh, yeah. it's a long, it's a longer minder yeah. episode. Yeah, yeah, it's a yeah. film. Let's make it its own entity. If you want the theme tune, Matt, it's at the end of every bloody song. Yeah. Uh, every that's every the, episode, I'm sorry. Yeah, that, that, that's the only thing I can get on to be honest. Just, just, just I, I, okay, the other day was like, God, I missed it. I bloody missed it. To be honest, it's just like you expect it to be there, and it's just, it's not. It's, oh, God, no. But they okay. never did those theme tunes, Anthony, with um, the 
Love Thy Neighbor film and the Bless His House yeah. on the, it wasn't no, on there. You're right. They, 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 they didn't, but it was just it was just such a character in the show and it's all that. Oh look, there's two pulling up in the, in the car park, but but, but oh look, the, the, the car's a bit dodgy, and and Arthur's just like nothing to do with me. Yeah, <sighs> yeah. Anyway, so four out of five would be a great to what? Eight out of ten, seven out of ten. Yeah, yeah. yeah. All right. All right, John. Uh, yeah, I greatly enjoyed it. I'd give it a seven out, seven out of ten. I think um, an immediate American comparison might be like those old uh, Hollywood crime comedies I I dig, like old Boston Blackie movies or The Thin Man or something like that. It's just you know, it's fun. It's comedy. There's action. There's suspense. Um, it's it's all meant to be enjoyable. You don't take it too seriously. There's no great social causes expressed in this, like if it were an HBO series. So, yeah. uh, and you, you, you the two leads, uh, great chemistry. Um, Waterman was probably at the height of his TV charisma, and, and vice versa for everybody. It's it's cool to see a young Amanda Pays. She's one of my favorite old uh, TV actresses, just for the Flash and Kindred, as I said earlier. And um, yeah, I, I think it's fun. Seven out of ten, easy. I, I had a blast, and I'd probably watch it again. Yeah, and we just lost Dennis Waterman a couple of yeah, weeks ago, right. didn't we? John Derbyshire, your favorite, Stu. He uh, he had mentioned his passing and said he loved Minder when his last couple of years when he lived in England before he moved, and he uh, linked to that theme song because it is a great name theme song. From? John Derbyshire, where do I know him from? Uh, mm -hmm. You remember the uh, he was in the Way of the Dragon. Oh, he! Oh, that's right. Conservative uh, podcaster and keep that's right. Radio yes. Derb yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, bloody hell! But he, oh, but okay. he had said on Radio Derb what a big fan he was of Minder, and and he loved the Dennis Waterman song and linked mm. to it and everything. And it was and I did it myself. Listened to it on YouTube a couple of times. Cool, cool. It was actually a huge hit. That ever. that was a huge hit when it came out. Just I, on yeah, the actual charts. So. Yeah, it was. Yeah. The, the, the B-side was even better because the B-side was a duet between Dennis Waterman and Arthur Curl. And the track was called What Are We Going to Get for Her Indoors? Yeah. <laughs> they did Top of the Pops. <laughs> oh, yeah. With uh, Jimmy Savile with Top of the Pops. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> he, he, he must not be mentioned. Oh, God. What an <laughs> asshole of a human being. Yeah. He, he's, he needs to be a discussion for another time, that guy. He's just... Oh, I could talk about that. The soft hours, the bland. Yeah. Anyway, I will give this a uh, six and a half out of ten. And I think my my only uh, thing that drew away from this for me was I watched it so late at night with a, a bit of bit of dreary, uh, bleary eyes and a lot of time. It's on a long weekend from working, and then uh, you know this country going to hell with Labor taking over, and and yeah. Uh, yeah, all the things on Sunday. So yeah, I will. I will. This will definitely be watched again. Definitely be watched again. So um, that's it. Mind on the Iron Express, kind of a Cliff Notes review. Sorry, friends, not a very in-depth one. Uh, because we had Anthony on, we wanted to speak about Minder and a lot of other British stuff. Uh, yeah, it's very hard setting up these three different time zones. Actually, nine. It's just. Very lucky Anthony was very kind to stay up at the That's uh, fine. It's, 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 ungodly it's, hour. But um, before we go, I just need to ask you one thing, Nez. Yep. <laughs> what do you think of Boris Johnson? Oh, my God. Uh, I might as well do it. Coach! They listen just for that alone. I mean, I, I do. I, every, I just go, when I've, when I've got the actual... Uh, your audio piece in the timeline, I see the timeline just stretch straight up and go, that's where the, that's where the crowd's coming in. But whenever I'm recording, recording each, each slot, when I get to the end, it's like the needle just jumps on screen in terms of the, the program or that's just like, it's like, it's like, it's like, it's like that. It's just, it's yeah. Jump. It's like a Bloody seismic hell. graph. You just then, off the chart then, sort of thing. It is funny, yeah. My next neighbors must be thinking, what, what the hell's going on next door? What's what, 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 what you doing? <laughs> Yeah. And the walls again. Let's put it that way. Probably why you probably why you have the uh, the old the old no, wall knocking on the door. <laughs> That's probably for that reason. <laughs> All right. Anyway, we better wrap it up. Nez, cheers, mate. Really appreciate Thank you coming you. on. You. Please come back again. Um, and John, as always, I'll see you yep. next week. And right. before you go, stick around for this guy's piece, Rubritania. And I'm going to say later. All right. Peace out. Tax. And now, 
it's time for Rue Britannia with your foreign correspondent, the Nez. In a move that will surprise nobody ever than those who think that liberal comedians shouldn't be assaulted on stage for supporting abortion, local up council elections took place across England and Wales, resulting in a bad night for both the Conservatives and Labour, though the latter more so than the former. In short, Tory projections were nowhere near as bad as expected. Labour won London, though posted disappointing numbers across England and Wales. Low tenets combined ensured that the metaphorical needle hasn't really moved for both parties in terms of the next general election in two and a half years' time, which is to say, Tory win and the Labour Party struggling to manage its own decline. The usual midterm rubbish. To further compound the sense of Labour woe, the day after local elections, Durham Constabulary announced their intention to investigate Labour leader Keir Starmer and the party over allegations of mass social gatherings during the two year pandemic window. Especially embarrassing given how he and Labour spent 12 months accusing Shirley and the Conservative government of the same thing. Typical of Labour to seize the fee from an average victory. Meanwhile, fan of plenty in short with the Lib Dems when, despite the usual midterm electoral knockoffs and successes, one of their elected candidates having been outed on the campaign trail for having a pawn past was then suspended over allegations of anti Semitism after having been elected. Little Brighouse, yet that's a real name has denied both the allegations of porn and racism, though in fairness if she was ever accused of murder, she'd probably just basically deny it in the same way. Even Shannon Tweed never swam in water that dirty. Sport. And the woke CRGT realm of the English Football Association was stunned to discover this week that an unnamed England footballer had been caught up in a £30,000 blackmail plot after betting a £150 per hour transsexual prostitute. The type of thing, I'm sure, which never happened to Roger Moore on For Your Eyes Only. Then again, the player, a household name, having compromised himself with such a company, went to the police when it transpired that the stranger in the night had secretly filmed numerous meetings. £150. You can buy free Arab Blu-ray box sets with that type of thing. I mean, what a waste. However, his refusal to make a statement to the police, this after his club were informed, ensures that the girl with the elongated extension gets to keep the £30,000 in extortion fees alone. In short, effectively the perfect crime. After all, I'd hate to think that the player in question was Manchester United's Harry Maguire. Further notes in passing, count down Dolly Bird Rachel Riley accused an undeemed dealer celebrity of using an Android device to upskirt her at a party. Count down. The type of weekday afternoon TV quiz show for students, prisoners and sex offenders. Not saying Countdown is dull, though if the show were a geographical location, it would be closed. As indeed is Rachel Riley's vagina. Meanwhile, over at the BBC, one of the fat hairy bikers has just been diagnosed with cancer. Maybe being a fat hairy biker, he should have actually basically stayed clear of snorting cocaine or strippers' breasts. I'm joking. I mean, if he's a biker, then I'm AOC. And the Queen puts her foot down yet again with Avisa Perron and her husband, Harry Markle by ruling that for her Golden Jubilee celebrations in the summertime, that the Markles will be formally barred from actually appearing on the balcony of Buckingham Palace in terms of the overall celebrations. In short, working royals only. Personally, I'm just surprised that Avita and Harry weren't consigned to the background with brown paper bags over their heads. Gucci, of course. And finally, as World War III trundled on to its third month, Boris Johnson and voters in their field marshal of Montgomery in a speech to the Ukrainian parliament, whereby he stated that he will simply accept nothing less than a full and conditional Ukrainian victory over Russia. Poor sods. Given that Montgomery was a military disaster, you'd have assumed that the Ukrainians had enough problems to deal with on a daily basis. That said, unlike Shirley, Zelensky doesn't really have to carry the burden of being a... (laughs) 